Well, good afternoon, everyone. The modern world in which we live has produced a, a very advanced uh, civilization, particularly in terms of science and medicine. We have labor saving devices, we have huge advancements in transport. We live in a world, uh, we, at least for some people of the earth, has resulted in much better health care, much better diet. People live a lot longer than they used to do in previous generations. So there are many positive uh, things to do with the modern world in which we live. And yet, I don't think that we would describe the world in which we live as a world of great happiness. No doubt some people feel that it is. There are, there are some people in certain circumstances who feel that it's great, that the life that they have. But generally, throughout the world, we wouldn't describe the world uh, as a world of, of great happiness. Because we can't escape the reality that in this world today, even though we have all these wonderful things, there is indeed a great deal of suffering. Daily we, we're confronted, if not directly in our own lives, it's evidence on our te television screens and in other forms of, of media. We present it, for instance, with those harrowing pictures of, of mothers with emaciated children in their arms, dying of malnutrition and disease. We have pictures of cities destroyed by war, and we, we see the injured and the dead, the, the casualties of the war. We see the refugees fleeing with only the clothes on their backs, hungry and thirsty and exhausted as they wander seeking refuge and risking and often losing as we've seen yet again th this last week. In fact, only yesterday was it 41 people drowned uh, 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 trying to get into Europe. They lose their lives in seeking something better. That suffering that's there is very evident uh, to us. And, and it may well be that our, our suffering is much closer to home. It may be that we ourselves have some kind of crippling disease with regular or even constant pain. It may be that our, our suffering is emotional with the loss of loved ones. There are so many aspects to, to suffering uh, that we see in the world today, aren't there? And so, for some people, one of life's big questions is, why does God allow suffering? Well, the, the first thing that I would say with regard to this question is that in a world in which more and more people uh, don't claim to have any religious beliefs, that the question should be asked that why does God allow suffering? That's surely an acceptance that there is a God, accepting the existence of God by even asking the question. The theory behind this question really is, if there is a God of love as the Bible presents God, then why is there so much suffering in the world? Now, the question of does God allow suffering is one that, that I think needs some explanation. What do we mean when we say why does God allow suffering? You see, as I say, for some people the fact that there is suffering in the world is proof to them or a reason to them to say well there can't be a God because if there was a God of love he wouldn't allow these things to happen and that's the, the viewpoint taken by some. Uh, for us as the Christadelphians it's really quite the opposite. Uh, almost the fact that there is so much hardship and suffering is evidence that God does exist. And the reason we say that is because in God's Word, the Bible, He has caused men to write about the kind of conditions that would apply in the world which could lead to suffering. I'm sure that we would recognize that the, the world has become a very self-centered and, and self-indulgent world. It's look after number one. And yet, 
it's amazing that in the Bible, the Word of God, um, we have some words which tell us that this would be the case. These are some words that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy over 2,000 years ago, and these are the words that he said. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's from the English Standard Version of, of those words in uh, 2 Timothy 3. And, and surely we can see when we, we see some of those things that the Apostle Paul wrote there, we see those things are evident in this world today. Men, are, people are lovers of their own selves. People are lovers of money. They can't wait to, to uh, buy a lottery ticket in the hope that, that they might gain great wealth. That people are proud and arrogant and disobedient to parents. And that there are those who are without self-control and brutal. And, and many of those things uh, can lead to different forms of suffering. We believe then that God, who is the creator and sustainer of the world, and all life on that world, that God has a plan and a purpose with the earth. And that plan and purpose, and a declaration of what that purpose is, is given in the Bible, God's word. So, in order to seek answers to these questions, we shall only find the answers in the word of God. So, this question of why does God allow suffering I'd like to, to put a scenario to you um, in with regard to this question those of us who are parents will know the difficulties that we have in bringing up children we'll know that we desire to instill into them a sense of right and wrong we encourage them and we seek to direct them so that they will have values in their life that they will grow up as responsible members of society we advise them and, and seek to take them along the path of education to lead them in the right direction so that they will be able to, to gain employment that, that will be able to uh, provide for them and their families as they come along and all of these things we, we desperately want for, for our families as we're bringing them up. And yet, in spite of all this, so often our children don't go down the, the route that we would want them to go. Many of us will, will have experience with our children that they have gone down a, a route quite contrary to, to that that we've sought to take them down. And that they have ended up with suffering and trouble. So have we allowed our children to do that in, in, the, in the style of the question as it's put to us? I, isn't it more a matter of that against all advice they have exercised their free will. They have chosen to go down that route and if they suffer as a result of that experience it is a suffering that comes from their own life choice. They've exercised that right of free will which everyone has and which is fiercely defended today. Remember that the, the Human Rights Acts sought to embed this into law that everyone has rights. The problem is that your rights and my rights may well come into conflict. It's a very hard lesson for parents, isn't it? When we see our children getting into these kind of problems and we have to leave them to suffer, hopefully that they will realise themselves and may be able to make changes in their lives. There is that saying that we're all familiar with, 
sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind and sometimes they have to be left to experience these things now what I've suggested to you there as something that uh, we would all be in uh, have been involved in with our children um, doesn't uh, I accept doesn't cover all aspects of suffering but it does demonstrate in reality the way that our children behave uh, it demonstrates what happens with men and women in the world and and just to some extent uh, explain God's position because God is seen as a father figure he wants to be seen as a father figure if you remember when the disciples came to Jesus and said uh, teach us how to pray that Jesus taught them a prayer that we know as the Lord's Prayer and that begins with our Father Jesus uh, seeks us to address God as our Father and God sees his creation as his family his children there are lots of references in the Bible to the children of God and just as we seek to teach and instruct our children that's really what God has done with with his word the Bible he has given us his word which contains information about the kind of life that we ought to live and he has on many occasions clearly stated what is right and what is wrong and he has backed that up there are lots of examples in the Bible that demonstrate the results of not re leading the correct kind of life uh, and it's there now freely able to be accessed by men and women and to read of it but man still ignores this and does what he likes uh, and often as a result there is suffering from this let me explain this with uh, an example of suffering um, one of the sufferings that we might uh, have considered is that of disease and the, the harm that comes from disease uh, and one group of diseases that is rampant in the world today is a disease that's become known as or diseases become known as STD sexually transmitted diseases these can be very painful it can become life affecting and they can and do lead to premature death it's a real problem in the world today treatment is available for some but just uh, as a for instance to, to demonstrate the seriousness of the problem the cost of treatment in the USA last year for sexually transmitted diseases was in excess of 14 billion dollars that's how much America spent last year on on this disease so would we say then that God shouldn't allow the suffering of those people who have contacted those diseases well I was interested when I when I looked on the, the website um, that the doctors who were engaged in these treatments and seeking cures for these treatments state very clearly and very categorically how STDs can be cured or prevented and it, it's absolutely clear um, and they say and this I took it straight from the from the website it says uh, to rid the world of STDs the world should not engage in sexual activity with others so the doctors tell us that the, the, the reason it's causing this is because of the promiscuity uh, of the people who are involved in it and if you don't want to have the suffering from this disease don't engage in sexual activity with others and that's that's remarkable in a way to see that something so clear and so straightforward is is spoken by the doctors involved in this because God has been teaching throughout the whole of the Bible that we shouldn't live promiscuous lives so it's not really a matter is it of, of God allowing this suffering surely it's a matter of men and women deliberately putting aside God's teaching and doing their own thing and the suffering that results is a consequence of their own actions 
it reminds me that it's it's rather like um, some of our rules for driving along the road. We know at a major junction there's likely to be traffic lights on the road and we know, we all know that red means stop and green means go. If we decide that we are going to not follow that route, we are going to choose to go on red, it's likely, isn't it, that there's going to be an accident. It's likely that there's going to be injuries. It's possible that there there's going to be death. It's certain that in these cases there's going to be suffering. You see, that's the trouble with human rights, isn't it? If I decide that the traffic lights we go on red and someone else decides we go on green, then at some place those two uh, viewpoints uh, come to a hazard and, and suffering results. And that's really what mankind does, doesn't it? With, with the laws and the rules that God has given, which are for our guidance, that we might learn to do that is right. The way the world has developed is into a very imperfect world. We, we saw on, from that quotation in 2 Timothy 3 that we have to accept that there are people in the world today who don't want to be team players. There are people who are wicked and evil and who have no respect for any laws but will do what they like. It's clear that there are even those who actually enjoy inflicting pain and suffering on others to get their own way. In the Second World War, at the end of the Second World War, it was said that the Second World War was to be the end, the war to end all wars. The horrific events in which so many people died were set to have created such an abhorrence of these things that war would never again be tolerated, that common sense would prevail and men would find a peaceful solution. Has it been so? Or well, not at all, has it? The suffering of war continues. There have been at least 156 wars since 1945. And that's only the ones who are act that are actually classified as wars. There are all kinds of other conflicts in which there's suffering and death. There are all kinds of other ones that would be included that would take that figure probably into the 600s since the Second World War. And so through our televisions we see the depravity and the destruction and the suffering that these wars cause. And I'm sure that those seeking to ask that question would say that, that God ought to prevent this suffering. God ought to do something about this suffering. Well, I wonder what the solution would be. What solution would we ask of God in order to, uh, to prevent this suffering? Let's suppose that God with his mighty power intervened by making it impossible to fire weapons of any kind. Would these wars then cease? No, they wouldn't, would they? Because the mindset of those people who were engaged in the wars have political intentions or aspirations of greatness or a desire to impose their will on, on others. May, many other reasons, perhaps. But the thinking behind that isn't going to go away if you take the, the, the ability to use... Uh, guns and and, uh, and weapons of war in that sense is it taking away that ability uh, w would simply change the intentions of uh, the, the way that you go about this and these people would use other ways surely to get their way there is no real peace in the world is there even whether there is no actual war taking place, place people live in fear of attack from radical groups. Just think about the situation that we have, and we've had a number of examples since uh, about around Christmas time, um, when the terrorists organizations have got to a stage now where they, they don't actually have to mount an assault uh, to, to bring panic and disruption to daily life. Just the fear of, 
of these things. A rumour comes out that there's going to be another attack in, in a particular city. And so the police close down the, the metros and, and transport links are, are, are severed, as it were, and they cause absolute disruption just with the fear of what might happen. And it's interesting that, that Jesus said that that would be exactly so. When the disciples came to Jesus in Luke 21 and asked Jesus about the signs of the times and what things would happen and when would they happen, Jesus said these words, men's hearts failing them for fear. And, and that's kind of the situation we're in at the moment, isn't it? Even without the terrorists making attack, uh, men's hearts are, are failing, they're terrified uh, for fear of what might happen and to looking after those things which are coming on the earth. The hatred and the animosity that we see presented by various factions of the world today make the possibility of finding a peaceful solution so that all men and women may live together peaceably somewhat of an impossibility isn't it and yet you know the Lord Jesus gave a very simple answer that, that would solve all of these problems it's, it's naive in its simplicity but powerful in what it would do the Lord Jesus said as you would that men should do to you do ye also to them likewise if all men and women would adopt that if they all men and women would follow Jesus' advice, then there wouldn't be any wars, would there? There wouldn't be any hatred and any violence because we'd all look after one another. And you see, my reason for mentioning this is that we said if we if we could stop the weapons of war being active, it would um, it wouldn't prevent wars. And we can see that the advice that Jesus gives is that to change people's mindset from a mindset of I'm going to have my way to a mindset of well I don't want them to harm me so I'm not prepared to harm anyone else. That wonderful advice that, that would bring peace uh, and tranquility to the world. But again it's a matter of men and women choosing to accept that advice we mentioned about about starvation uh, and we're all aware of those horrendous suffering as I mentioned before in various parts of the world men and women especially children dying for lack of food and water and, and we see those horrendous pictures uh, and we'd all like a, a solution to that problem wouldn't we but, but again we might ask well what would the sol solution be what would we want God to do um, in order to solve that problem well I suppose the answer would be that we would want God to provide food and water for them wouldn't we that would seem to, to, to be the answer let's just consider for a moment that whilst these children and their parents are dying of starvation in other parts of the world there are men, women and children who are dying or at least having their lifespan shortened because they eat too much because they're overweight there are in this country alone hundreds of people now who weigh in excess of 30 stones there are people who are totally confined, confined to their own house because they physically cannot get through the door there are people who cannot get up off their bed to take care of themselves and have to be completely looked after by others and these people are dying because of diabetes and the, the problems that this weight causes this is in other parts of the world so on the one hand we've got people who are dying of starvation on the other hand we've got people who are dying because they've got too much feed, food, eat too much of it of the wrong kind of food and, and perhaps we suggest that well why doesn't God do something about this well just looking at those two things hasn't God already done something God has provided a planet this earth on which we rest 
which at least up to the present time has produced sufficient food so that no one needs to go hungry. He's given sufficient food already for all. It's about the distribution, isn't it? It's about where mankind deals with that food that's available. The problem of the starving could be solved, but it's unlikely to be so as far as mankind is concerned. So it isn't a fair question, is it, to, to, or a fair accusation to suggest that God doesn't intervene? Isn't it really a case of man misusing what God has already provided? Perhaps pain is another avenue that we would consider as regards suffering. There are many examples of people in terrible pain from <coughs> illnesses or injuries some are for getting any kind of pain relief at all. So are we saying that, that God should rid the world of pain so that no one needs to suffer? Well the idea of not having any pain sounds wonderful doesn't it? It's, it sounds great to those of us who, who've got pains and probably most of us have um, not to have them sounds wonderful. But what we have to remember is that pain is a matter of of the body telling us that something is wrong. There are instances of people who do not have pain receptors and these people have done permanent damage to themselves because they're unable to feel pain. There's a record of one individual who has so many injuries because he didn't feel pain. He had scars on his buttocks down to the bone from sitting on a heater and not feeling that it was hot. He has a permanently deformed foot from having broken a bone in his foot and not knowing that he'd done so, had walked on it for months before it was discovered. He, his hands bought or bear so many bad cuts that he is unable to, to straighten his fingers and be able to use his hands. Pain, or the lack of pain, really has in a sense caused the suffering uh, th uh, that this young man uh, has experienced. But doctors will tell us that it's not really just about trying to treat the pain but to see a cure for the disease or what is causing the pain. And so for God to remove all suffering would mean that God would have to take measures to remove the evil that leads to suffering. You know, there was a time many years ago when God looked at the world and he saw that there was an awful lot of evil there. There was so evil, so much evil and wickedness that God found it necessary to take drastic action. It's way back in the Old Testament. We're going, not going to turn it up. I'm going to just quote you uh, from it. It's in Genesis chapter 6. It's the time of Noah and the flood. And this is what we read there. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that, just, just think about these words that we're reading. That, the, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It repented that the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man who am I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowls of the air. For it repented me that I have made them. So God in his wisdom decided to remove this wickedness. And so he destroyed those of that world of that day with the flood. We don't know how many people there were, but probably thousands, and God caused them to be destroyed by the flood. Now there are those who would say, well that's not a very loving act, is it? If we're saying that God is a God of love, that's not a very loving act. But God, besides causing this to happen, did provide an opportunity for those who would listen, for those who would take notice, to be saved there was an opportunity for, for those that were there if they listened to the preaching of Noah when Noah told them that there was going to come a flood on the earth 
if they had believed Noah and believed what God had said they had opportunity to come and to be saved in the ark but again men and women chose to exercise their free will and as a result they died and only Noah and his family obeyed God and were saved and it is drastic action indeed but here was a, a, a time when God saw that it was necessary to remove this wickedness from the earth so when we look at this problem of suffering we begin to realize that it, it's not simply a matter of expecting God to take out of the lives of everyone on the planet all kinds of suffering and, and if God did we wouldn't accept it because in order to take away all forms of suffering it would mean that God would have to control our lives it would mean us losing that free will that we all like to have God wants men and women to obey him but he wants them to do it willingly you know the, the question that is posed that forms the basis for this talk is a question which if we're serious about it if we're serious in in wanting to find a world without suffering then we should read the Bible because God wants a world without suffering in fact more than that God has promised that there will be on the world on this earth a world without suffering that is the eventual outcome that, that God promises for the world so in answer to the question why does God allow suffering the answer is that God is going to do something about the suffering in the world it's part of the plan that God has for the earth and man upon it God is going to create on the earth a kingdom known as the kingdom of God again if you're familiar with the Lord's Prayer you'll remember the words thy kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it is done in heaven that is God's promise that he will establish upon the earth this kingdom it will have a king the Lord Jesus who will return to the earth and in Isaiah 32 you didn't turn these up because I'm going to quote them to you just one verse from Isaiah 32 we read behold a king shall reign in righteousness and princes shall rule in judgment so the Lord Jesus is going to come back and he is going to have a righteous law that is going to be throughout the earth the, the law that will bring righteousness to the earth because he will implement these things in the earth and, and what will that mean verse 17 of Isaiah 32 says and the work of righteousness shall be peace one of the things that we've we've asked about is why are there wars and, and that we're looking for peace and the Lord Jesus is going to put righteousness into operation which will bring peace it says and the effect of this righteousness it says will be quietness and assurance forever what a lovely thing to think about the time when we can we can live in in assurance and, and feel happy about the things that are happening and he says my people shall dwell in a habitable uh, in, sorry shall dwell in a peaceable habitation when Jesus establishes that kingdom war will be ended that's one of the things again that we've we've said that needs to be solved again we're going to read some verse some words Micah chapter 4 we read and he shall judge among many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off you see it will be necessary to take drastic action because all nations won't accept God's righteous laws they will still want to do their own thing but the Lord Jesus will have the power to, to deal with those nations and the effect of it will be and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks nation shall not lift up a sword against nation neither shall they learn more war, sorry, learn war anymore there won't be any need to train in war because wars are going to be brought to an end but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree and none shall make them afraid so it says Micah 4 
And again, some of the effects of, of this time when the Lord Jesus uh, uh, puts these things into, into operation, Isaiah 35 tells us that the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. And the lame man shall leap as an heart and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. So, so, and I, I'm sure it's not meant to just be confined to those to the blind and to the lame um, but here is surely a picture that tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to heal and cure all diseases and remember we said earlier that, that, that the doctors will tell us it's not about treating the pain it's about treating the diseases and so by removing those diseases by curing those diseases uh, pain won't be a problem in the wilderness, again from Isaiah 35, shall waters break out and streams in the desert. So th th this matter of, of places in the world where they have no food will, will be solved by the fact that the, the uh, weather situation will, will be different. The parched ground shall become a pool and thirsty land springs of water. These are just some of the, the things that God has promised to happen upon the earth. We saw that in the time of the flood it, it was drastic action. And since that time, God's word has still been available. Men and women have been given ample time to listen and to learn of the best way to live their life. But as we've seen, free will is still important to men and women. And it will need that drastic action for Jesus when he returns with power and great glory, we read, he has the power to put down those who will not listen to his teaching and will in the course of his kingship of a thousand years bring the earth into this glorious kingdom that we've had a brief glimpse of in some of the quotations we've looked at. I want to conclude with, with my final uh, quotation to you now and, and this is one which is, is really lovely and really uh, strikes home to the, the hearts of every one of us because of this description of what this kingdom time it will be like. He's taken from Revelation 21 verses 3 to 6 and there we read And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying Behold the dwelling place of God is with man and he will dwell with them they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them as their God. And listen to these words he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Isn't that a, a picture of, of really getting rid of the suffering in the world? And, and uh, death shall be no more. How wonderful to think that, that God has promised that also. Neither shall there be mourning. Well, there won't be mourning if there's no, no death, will there? No crying, no pain anymore. For the former things are passed away. This is what God not only wants for the earth, but promises for the earth. And so we read, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And that's really what the world needs, isn't it? A new start with righteous laws, with someone in command who has the power to ensure that these things uh, operate. He said, write down, for these words are trustworthy and true. God seal that these things are what are going to happen. He said unto me, it is done, I am Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So the thirsty I will give from the springs of the water of life without payment. So then, why does God allow suffering? Well, God has allowed men to have the opportunity to to go their own way. He's given them free will. He has sought to teach men and women about the best way to live. But men and women, generally speaking, have gone their own way and we see the results in the world that these have led to. And so, thinking back to the time of Noah and the flood, are we going to be those people who simply say, well, we want something better but we're not prepared to, f to follow what God says. The people at the time of the flood who said, I, I don't think it's going to rain, I don't think there's going to be a flood, and th they died as a result. Perhaps we should learn that lesson, that when God promises something, it will happen. He's promised this wonderful kingdom. It will happen. But 
if we want to be there then we have to learn more about what God wants from us and try to walk in his ways thank you for listening